God is good. I, I remember a song, I, I got to go back about 30 years. A, a guy uh, was given a bit of a testimony. It was a, a watch night service. A guy was giving a testimony and he, he wanted to sing a song. And it was probably the, some of the poorest singing I've ever heard besides myself. But he sang it with such, such heart that there's literally not a dry eye in the place. You could see that guy, he, he believed every word. He was just feeling every, every, uh, every line of that song. And the emotion that the Lord had dealt with him when he, uh, when he got saved was just flooding back. And uh, I think that had more effect than two hours of preaching. Never underestimate your testimony of what God's done for you to reach people's hearts. Because uh, he'll use his word. That's absolutely a fact. But when you couple that with what he's done for you, people can't argue with that. Take your Bibles this morning. Uh, man, I feel like I already preached the message this morning uh, from uh, 1 Kings 17. Every step I take, the Savior goes before me. It's good that he's uh, uh, omniscient and omnipotent because he's going behind me too and he's on both sides to keep me safe and he's above me and below me to carry me through. I want to preach you a message this morning about God meeting your needs. I think the biggest reality why most Christians fail in, the, in their daily walk, why most lost people never come to Christ in any uh, uh, sincere way, why most of the world looks at the, the Christian and, and kind of just uh, with that skeptical eye is because we live most of our life wondering, I wonder if God really going to take care of this. I wonder if God can really do it. Our lives must be one of absolute conviction that the God in whom we have to do can do everything that he's promised above and beyond all that we're able to ask or think. If he can do that, our lives would, would uh, manifest the glory, the smile, the joy, and the happiness of all of these things. Uh, let me read here uh, the first uh, seven verses of chapter 17. It's about uh, Elijah, and it, he's, uh, he has a ministry here that uh, is quite interesting. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's a pretty powerful statement. He didn't make that up out of his own mind. God revealed it to him. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, uh, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Uh, uh, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Elijah is a man... The Bible says in the book of James, subject to like passions as we are. So what he's thinking about those things, you might relate to the, well, that's what I'd be thinking about that. Well, amen. Maybe you learn something from all those. The, the goal and the point of all of those things is so we can see a man that God greatly used, had great victories over the devil, uh, had a great opportunity to uh, stand before 850 heathen priests and just ridicule their their uh, impotent faith in an impotent God who could accomplish nothing and then fall apart at the seams and run for his life. You say, well, what's that all about? God showing him that he can do what he says he can do. Uh, how many of you have ever prayed for something and then, no, I don't know whether God's going to do that or not. Well, listen, I, that's, the, that's the first thing that pops into my head. I don't know whether he'll do that or not. But I have to live believing that because I asked him, he heard me. And if it's something good, he'll do it. But if it's not, he's got a better plan. It isn't like, oh, if he doesn't do that, everything's going to fall apart. If he doesn't do what I want, everything will get better. Because it won't be my plan anymore that God just, yeah, all right, what a dumb idea, but I'll do it. It's his plan. So there's a thread that runs through humanity. And the one thing everybody has in common is we all have needs. We all have things that happen to us, circumstances in our lives. And we begin 
uh, the anxiety of how is this going to be answered? How is this going to be responded to? What's going to be the outcome of this thing? And the truth be told, we don't generally know. We all speculate on, well, I know that person or I know this situation. I've had that happen before. Uh, but quite frankly, we've had church services every day, every Sunday, barring uh, snowstorms or blizzards or something for 35 years. But it's the first time that young lady ever got saved. So I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I'm not even sure what the rest of the afternoon is going to bring. All I know is, is this, that God's got a great plan. I've got to yield myself to it, allow him to work out his plan. And he's going before me to prepare the way. When he sent Elijah down there, he says, uh, I'm going to have your food. There's a famine in the land. There's a, there's a, a, a drought in the land. But I'm going to have your, your food airmailed to you. Special delivery. Wow. The king's wondering where his next meal will come from. Elijah's down there just laying by the brook, listening to the brook bubble and uh, waiting for the uh, afternoon and the morning delivery to come. Some days the greatest needs of our life will be uh, physical. Sometimes the greatest need we have is spiritual. That's almost always. And our natural reaction is worry about everything. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things, and those things are all of the things that the world worries after. Food, clothing, housing, how are people going to think about me? What am I going to do for a living? Who am I going to marry? How's my family going to treat me? How's all this going to... The Lord says, listen, you just put me first. I'll take care of the details. That's what we call life. And life in Christ is a whole lot better than life outside Christ. Sometimes uh, we, we have a, a sense of God's care and provision and it's just a, that overwhelming, wow! And sometimes we have the opposite effect of, God, don't you care? Yeah. But we've got lessons to learn, just like children. You don't always give them what you want because you know that in their need, can, a lesson can be given them that they might never forget that will stand by them throughout the rest of their life. And if they don't get that lesson, they're going to have to get it over again. And if they don't get it then, they're going to have to be taught over and over and over again. Don't let every lesson be learned the hard way. One time Jesus' disciples came to him and they were talking about a fig tree that he'd cursed. And uh, they're worried about the, the priest and the scribes uh, over Mark 11 that want to kill him. You know what Jesus said? Have faith in God. You know what their faith was in? The wicked nature of men. They're going to do that. He says, have faith in God. You think God can't overcome wicked men? You think God can't overcome bad circumstances? You think God can't, uh, can't overpower a man's conscience and, and show him something? Anybody know who Paul was before he got saved? He was on his way with letters from the priest up to Damascus to get, uh, get Christians back and put them in jail. And the Lord said, uh, where are you going, Paul? What you doing? <laughs> well, that's not exactly what he said. I'm just taking a little hint from Adam Schiff, making up the story. But it's the, it's the truth. You know what Paul wanted to know as he looked up from the ground? Who are you? And what do you want me to do? Boy, I tell you what, at the end of the day, what God wants you to know is who he is and what he wants you to do. And in case everybody falls asleep before the end of the message, he wants you to trust him. He wants you to learn to trust him no matter how dark the day, how long the night, how deep the circumstances or how murky the waters you're swimming in. Trust him because he can do it. There are a lot of things in our need. Elijah, uh, he might have thought because of who he was. I mean, he's, he's been commissioned by God to stand before the king and tell him some things. He, wow, that's, that's big. I, I'm powerful. I'm, I got God on my side. And the next thing you know, he's suffering the same de deprivation of food and water that everybody else is. So the Lord... Uh, calls him to an uncommon service. And a lot of people think, well, I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing right. I've seen young people. You know, you, you preach a message. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He'll, he'll put his blessings on you. 
And, and their reaction is, well, I did write all week or all day. Well, yeah, but you can't overcome a lifetime or you don't know what God's got next week. It's keep on doing those right things. And then uh, how many of you got saved and found out, uh, like Brother Jim, instead of your family being really excited for you, they got mad at you. Yeah. Well, how dare you do that? How dare you leave your, you know, your ancestral church? Or... Simple, it was going to put me in hell. I didn't want any part of it. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to go to heaven when I died. I want my sins forgiven. Everybody tends to think, boy, now that I'm saved, everything in life is going to be good. I wish I could say you're right. Everything is working to the good. Everything is moving to the good. Because one day we're going to be standing in heaven. And that's good. But in the meantime, you've got an enemy. And I think this is what most of the world doesn't seem to grasp onto. The devil is the enemy of your soul. The devil is the enemy of righteousness. The devil is the sworn enemy of God himself. He seeks to overthrow God. And if God is in your life, he's looking for you and setting you up as a target. Say, well, that's terrifying. I'm never going to get saved now. Well, then you're his by default. At least put up a fight. When God's on your side, that's the devil's plan. But let me just assure you, God has a better plan for your life than the devil's. But the, the Lord will allow sometime the devil to deal with you in those things. I suspect that Elijah thought, man, everything's going to be cool now. Where, man, I, I've done what God wanted. I've, I've confronted Ahab about that stuff. And going to be, man, we're going to be in River City now. And he finds himself uh, out by a brook in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't even have a friend to help him. If he falls down out there, he can't even run back to Ecclesiastes. He's got no friend to help him. He's just there, except for God, and God is with him. That uncommon service that God calls us to is also uncommonly provided for. In every case that you uh, find yourself, uh, I, I got a message I've been working on. I can't ever seem to, to make it make any sense even to me, which is saying something. Uh, it's about Esther and uh, her uncle Mordecai, and uh, uh, they're they're thing between them is, is if, if God didn't deliver them through what Esther was going to do, deliverance would come from another way. And you think, well, how, what's that mean? Our, our church has at times been uh, very low in numbers. I, I would say now is one of them, but it's been worse than this. Uh, we've also been full. And in every case, God's provided for us. And early on, I got I to tell you, I'd, I'd uh, look at my finger and I'll say, I don't want to start chewing them. It's a dead giveaway. You're, you're not trusting the Lord. But I'd be concerned we're going to be able to pay our bills. We've always paid them. Because if, if, if we didn't have enough people sitting in this room to pay the bills, we'd get a check from somebody else. Somebody I, maybe I didn't even know. We were uh, street preaching down a mystic one day and some people came by from New York City. And they just were excited to see somebody out street preaching. They were real happy. They stopped. They talked with us for probably five, ten minutes, and we had a good time and prayer. And they left. I didn't think anything more about it. About a month later, I got a check from uh, from them. It was two families. There was a, a, a three hundred and fifty dollar check and a, I think a hundred and fifty dollar check in that envelope. I say, what's that all about? God providing for our needs. I put that in that box. I said, you would have thought it was a million. Because you know why? I knew that it was God that had prompted those people to give. Now listen, that's how God, God didn't write a check. It didn't have signed God. Uh, that, that's what the lost world thinks. I, I wish that's the way it worked. But it's God uses his people. Sometimes he uses lost people to do those things. But he'll get it done. Truth of the matter is, is we expect a lifetime of goodness when we get saved. And like Job, Sometimes, because man born of a woman is full of trouble, as the sparks fly upward, trouble just comes. We live in a world filled with trouble. We live in a world, the Bible says, is uh, uh, everybody is dead in trespasses and sins. We live in a, in a world that is un, unmitigated evil all around us. You say, how in the world can you smile at that? Because God's with us. God's on my side. I'm on his side. More important that way. But it's in a situation where Elijah says, well, I did right, and look what happened. 
and now I'm down here and, well, this is pretty good. Food, water, and the water dries up. Probably the bird got shot. Then what? Well, anybody think God only has one bird in the world? Anybody think God only has one plan that if that fails or that doesn't work out or God completes that, it, what in the world am I going to do now? How am I going to take care of those people now? You read that Bible, you know what you find? You find the most astounding ways that God resolves problems. They're being attacked by the Midianites, and what does God tell them? Get the guys together. Let's get ready for a fight. They get 32,000 men. Send a bunch of them home. Well, how are we going to do it? Well, less than we got now. We're still way outnumbered. Send them home. Anybody that does this, anybody that does this, send them home. Anybody scared, tell them to go home. I want volunteers. He's left, and, and he says, well, that's still too many. Send them home. And old Gideon, he's looking at this army down there that's just spread over the whole valley. And he's, he's uh, uh, Lord, uh, you know they all went home, right? You know, what do we do? He'll get you some jars. Oh, yeah, we're going to take jars. We're going to make up some great big bombs in these jars. Boy, we're going to get up there and just throw them on them. No, that's not what I had in mind. But what are you going to do? Well, I'll put a candle in it. Put a light in it? Yeah. How, how's that going to work? <laughs> well, you're going to break the jar. That ought to defeat an army. You know what Gideon did? He just did what God told him. He took those men. He surrounded that thing. Now, listen, 300 men, they're, they're pretty far apart. And they've got these jars with the lamps burning inside them. And at the sound of... Uh, uh, the, the alarm, they're to break those jars. And those people in the army are to look up on the hills and there's, they see these, a lamp burning. Terrifying, isn't it? When you add God to that, it is. You know what they thought? The Israelites and all their allies had them completely surrounded. They're going to kill every single one of them. You know what the enemy did? Turn tail and run. Left everything behind. Get out of here. Run for your life. Never minimize God's victories in your life in ways that you have not conceivably imagined. There's another group of time, an invading army, and, uh, and the, the, the king says, what are we going to do? And uh, the prophet says, dig a bunch of ditches out there. Oh, yeah, we're going to dig trench warfare. That'll be great. We'll... No, no, no. Pour water in them. We're going to drown them? <laughs> How deep these trenches got to be? Just enough to hold water. Really? Well, then what? Uh, nothing. You just stay, stay out of sight. The next morning, that advancing army looks down there. They look over the hilltop. You know what they see? They see that whole valley. They didn't see the water. You know what they saw? The sun coming up on that, and it's all red. You know what they thought? They've killed another army here already. Let's get out of here. In each case, God didn't even have to lift a finger. God didn't have to raise up a sweat to accomplish His will. Do you think He can't help you? You're not facing an army. Maybe you are, but He can do it, can He? Yeah. In verse 8, i got to get moving here. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Great. So now I'm out of food. I'm out of water. I'm in a land that's a famine. Uh, there's no rain coming. And I'm going to go see a widow who's going to take care of me. Good plan. Uh, verse 10, so he arose, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman. You know, it doesn't say a widow woman, it says the widow woman. How do you suppose she managed to be there then? Uh, I tell you what, our God is a God of arrangements. So, well, it's just a circumstance. Well, if it's a circumstance, God arranges those circumstances to the benefit and the benevolence of his, uh, of his, his people. Uh, so he rose as the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, some people said the Baptist church must have been back there because that preacher's wanting something to eat and says, uh, Give me something first. No, it's not like that. It's sort of a trial balloon. You know, you float something up just to see how it's received. And look what her answer is. Verse 11 is, She's going to fetch it. 
He called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son there, and may eat it and die. That doesn't sound like a, a welcome feast to the, to the preacher. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like some discouraged saint that is under the same penalty of famine and drought that the king is under because of his wickedness and everybody else is simply because they live there. You know, your proximity to an evil world means that you and I are in a world where they're all screaming about one thing, one problem, one circumstance or another. But you and I ought to be different. We ought to say, uh, he's able to deliver me. You might think it's going to be global warming. You don't know the half of that. It's coming and you're not going to think, uh, think it's just uh, cutting down on your car use is going to fix it. So anyway, uh, he says, verse 13, And Elijah said to her, Fear not. That's a good answer. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. Say, so why would he want to be first? What is her first offering? Brother over here mentioned that. Giving. You know, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is the righteousness of God? Do what God said. You know what, you know what the difference is between Elijah and and today, we got a book here. She had to trust Elijah. Now, Elijah's been living out there for some time, I don't know how long, in the woods by a brook. He probably looked somewhere between a homeless guy and just in a guy that says, I'm dying of hunger. But somehow God work these things out. You say, how did he do that? I don't have any idea. All I know is, is that every step I take, the Lord goes before me. He makes the way so that I can be successful doing what he's called me to do. And this lady said, okay, I believe that. So she goes. And here's this promise. It's, it's interesting that she gets a promise in, it in verse 14. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, verse 13. And bring it unto me, and after, make for thee and for thy son. You know what she's thinking? I got a handful of meal. And I got two sticks. How big a fire you think I'm going to make, preacher? I see the size of the belly on you. <laughs> she didn't say that. Okay. Here's what he says. Verse 14, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Here's a woman who suffered untold sorrow that her husband's gone. She's still got a child left to raise with no, no man in the house. She's in the midst of a famine. And if you've never read the Bible, you might realize that widows didn't have welfare programs that they could get on. They didn't have a whole lot of resources. They lived off of the benevolence of others for the most part, or their son, that widow of Nain, I was lamenting that her only son had died and the Lord took him down off of that funeral bier, raised him to life and sent him home with her to take care of his mom. God is good. God is kind. God is gracious. The goodness of God is what leads people to repentance. So she, he sees that and he says, I'm going to take care of her. She's doing right. She's being faithful. She's responding to the preaching that uh, Elijah, I'm going to take care of her. The whole time this famine's going on in the land, it says the, the, the meal, uh, the meal, the, the little handful of meal in the barrel didn't fail. Anybody think that she went in there and took a shovel out there and shoveled out the meal? 
I bet every time she went in there, it's the same handful in there. And she's probably looking in there and, well, there's, there's still a handful left. And tomorrow there's a handful left. And a week later, there's a handful left. And a year later, there's a handful left. You say, well, well why didn't God just fill it up? Maybe, just maybe, he wanted her to come back there and recognize God's still taking care of me. You know what we forget? Every day we need that, that relationship restored, renewed, encouraged, strengthened. Sometimes, well, once a week's enough. Might be enough for you. It's not for me. I need to know God's with me all the time. Hath he not said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee? Therefore, I'll not fear what men will do. It manifests the supply of what God has given. Paul, there was no stake in there. No, there wasn't. There was no great abundance of stuff. There was sufficient for the needs. They were living better than anybody else around them by simply trusting God that he'd give them their daily needs. Everybody else is worried. Everybody else is scrambling. Everybody else is scraping. And every day, Lord said, there's enough. There's enough. Just trust me. The events in your life and mine are brought into conformity by our will. You can fight against God all you want. You can struggle against trusting God, but you do it to your own peril and your own hurt. When you get to the point where you say, I know I can trust him. I, listen, I'm not going to say, you sit there, ah, oh, Lana, this is just wonderful. But it leads to the life most people can't imagine. A life of expectancy, a life of excitement, wondering, how's he going to do it? I, I no doubt he's going to do it. Can't wait to see how. Going to flood the field, make it look like blood? He going to chase, just uh, uh, hear, hear some sounds in the army and chase everybody away so that Israel's famine is broken and those lepers can bring back a report of, hey, there's tents out there from a whole army, full, the mess tents there, the supply tents there, all our, their uh, uh, money and, and valuables and weapons are left behind. They just left it all for us. The famine's over. Or is God just going to kind of bring it back to normal? For almost 40 years, God fed Israel in the wilderness with manna. And the day they entered the land, the, the manna stopped. What do you suppose those people thought? Well, we've been complaining all these years. Now it's gone. Well, now you got to get to work. But God's still providing. He's still meeting needs. We think when something bad happens in our lives that it's all over. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them up, uh, that walk uprightly. Isn't that true? Everybody been saving a lot of time to understand that, but let me give you another verse. Isaiah 45, 7, God says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Why? Because there's something in his will for you or those around you that require God to do something. Now listen, I've had people say, well, sin is God's fault. This, that's sort of a Calvinist idea that all sin is God's fault. You know, God is this great sovereign and he does all this stuff. When he says, I create evil, if you look at the context of evil in the, in the, uh, in the Bible, it's not sin. It's something that goes against what your thinking is for your own good. God forms evil is something that, well, I, didn't, I don't see how that's good for me. But God says, farther along, you'll understand why. Just hang in there. Just do right. You'll see what that was all about. There's a, a thing you see in an internet kind of thing once in a while. God, why, why are you putting me in this great big storm out here? And he says, because your enemies can't swim. Oh. <laughs> All the things we think somehow are working bad for us, God says, oh no, oh no. I'm not taking the Romans 8, 28 out of the Bible and all things are working to the, together for good to them that love me and are called according to my purpose. The idea of salvation 
exemplifies what God has done. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but John Calvin says that Jesus Christ was crucified before the world was. Well, how'd he do that? He wasn't even in a body yet. That couldn't possibly be true. He had Michael Servetus burned at the stake because he said that Jesus, uh, Michael Servetus says, no, Jesus was born in the fullness of time. God brought forth his son, made of a woman, born under the law. Uh, like Galatians says, Calvin says, oh no, he was born in eternity because the Bible says before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. You gotta be pretty stupid to think that's what that means. What that means is God says he knows, all the, knows the end of all things from the beginning. When God says, I'm gonna make me a world and here's how it's all gonna work. Here's what I'm gonna do in all of it. And every last detail is finished from the beginning to the end. You know, you and I are in that world. You and I, our lives, our situations, our circumstances, our problems, our troubles, our health, our failures, our successes are all considered in that thing because God knows the end of it. And he's gonna have his way. And if you're one of his, his way is not to hurt you. His way is not to torture you. His way is not to make you miserable. His way is to glorify you in him so that you can draw close to him and he can bless you. But in all that, there are some things that we look at and say, ah, I don't want to go through that. Jesus didn't want to go to that cross, but he saw it as the necessity to fulfill righteousness. He saw it as the necessity for your salvation. So in the fullness of time, not eternity, Jesus Christ was crucified. God had a present supply we read about being fed by ravens, but he needed to move on. Why? Well, because it isn't just about you and it wasn't just about Elijah. Over in Zarephath is a widow woman. Now I take it that she's a really good woman. And God says, that poor woman and one more meal is going to starve to death. And the plan that was made before the world was is that Elijah should leave that. Well, if you're getting your food air mailed to you and you've got one of the best drinking uh, fountains in the country at that time, why would you leave? So God dries up the water chases him over there and says, there's a widow woman over there. I'm going to do something for you. And he didn't say it, but he uh, says, uh, you know what? You're going to do something for her. And for the length of that famine, the length of that drought, you're going to look after each other. God is good, isn't he? I thank God that he is so concerned with our well-being that every provision we could conceivably think of, he's taken care of. But you know what's a lot better than that? All the ones I didn't think of, he took care of. Let me ask you something. When you take your kids on a trip, you know, not when they're 20, but when they're four, five, six, you know, Anna and Steve and Brandon and uh, Lauren, little Serena, she doesn't come say, Mom, you taking water for me? Or, are you taking something for me to eat? Are you going to make sure I can ride in the car? What are we, what are we going to do when we get there? What's, what's going to happen? You know what she assumes? I'm a mom and dad. Everything's going to be just fine. <laughs> Isn't that great? You remember Jesus, he said, except you become as a little child. I don't think he made like that. I think what he's talking about is you've got a father you can trust. You've got a God that loves you. And you've got a God not only this limited by this stuff here, they can do anything. If the sun needs to stop for a while while you're in the middle of a conflict, no problem. If he needs to move it ahead to show somebody something or to move it back to something, he can do it. You know what we are? We are the most well-prepared and cared for people on the face of this earth. And why should we worry about anything? Why should we spend our days fretting? What are they doing? Well, it looks like they're, well, why isn't there any justice? Justice is coming. There's a secret to getting your needs met though. And this is where the, the cru crucial thing, we've got five minutes left and I'm gonna quit at 12. So I'm gonna have to make up another four pages of preaching. 
you got to find out what God wants you to do. That's part number one. You know, anybody want to take a wild guess at what part number two is? You got to do it. Because see, you could get that level of conviction that it drive you right to your knees, break your heart about your life and your sin. But if you don't call on the Lord, you know what you are? Still lost. You could, you could say, well, I know the Lord could do all these things. And that, that uh, Elijah, he said, make it for me. And no, I'm not, I'm not putting you first. There are plans that God has that come into our lives that it looks like God says, you just sit in the back row, but do this for somebody else. Do this for that reason. Do this for that purpose. Well, I just don't see how that's going to You and I don't see a lot of things, but God does. He knows how to get the response that he wants. He knows how to lay out the challenges that we can meet by faith. We can meet by trusting him. We can meet by a willingness to yield our own fleshy desires to the blessing and benefit of others. But the minute we put ourselves in first, if that, what do you think would have happened if that lady said, hey, get in line, buster. I don't, I don't want to be hauled off by the, uh, the, uh, the uh, child welfare services for putting you ahead of my child. She didn't consider what the options were other than doing what that prophet asked. Said, so, well, yeah, but you know, those guys, you know, I understand all that. Just make sure you understand God's voice. The Bible says his sheep hear his voice and he knows them. Far too many Christians don't know God's voice. They know somebody else's maybe. Our faith must be in the will of God. People can come up with all sorts of plans, but if God is not the author of them, they will not succeed to the point of God's blessing. They might succeed immediately, but they will not be the blessing God had. And there must be faith in the way that God operates. You just got to trust God. That's a terrifying prospect. Listen, one of the most exciting things in the Christian life is living by faith because you don't have any clue what God's going to do next. And one of the most terrifying things of being a Christian is living by faith because you don't have any idea what God's going to do next. And it may be something you don't want to do. It may be something you're reluctant to follow through on. But if God says it, faith simply responds to God's demands, to God's claims, to God's promises. And it lives with a, with the childlike sincerity of my father said so. Well, how do you know that? My father said so. My daddy can do this. My dad can do that. Isn't it great when little children, my, my wife uh, was telling me one time, she says, when I was a kid, I thought my father could, could do anything, which is hysterically funny if you had ever known her dad. He could probably do it, but it would involve a big hammer and screws and, a, and a duct tape. He was not a fixer. She says she found a cat that had been hit by a car, dead in her mackerel, and she brought it in went to him one time to fix it. <laughs> Needless to say, it didn't get fixed. Elijah just keeps moving and moving and moving and moving. Look at this here, real quick. Verse 17, it came to pass after these things. Imagine this, they've been eating and living and prospering and blessing. And boy, I bet bow their head over that, that barrel and say, Lord, I looked in there and there's only a handful of meal left in there. I don't know how I'm going to eat tomorrow. And every day there's another handful. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Dead. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Anybody wonder what sin she's talking about? I don't, I don't have any idea. I just wonder if anybody else did. <laughs> I'm going to guess since it involved their son, maybe it's where that son came from. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, everybody's speculation is valid, I guess. All I know is this. You know what she thought when something bad came into her life? Same thing Elijah did when the brook dried up. Well, well, I'm, Lord, I'm right where you wanted me. I'm, I'm right in the, I'm, man, I'm in the center of your will. I, I am in the, the ten ring. I'm doing everything just like you said. And the, well, and the water dried up. And the bird didn't show up. 
And she says, I'm providing him food every day. I'm doing everything that I need to do. And my son dies. What good is it to serve God? That's how lost people think. That's how a lot of saved people conclude things. They think maybe it was their sin that brought that on. Did the Lord know who you were when he saved you? Yeah, Stacy and I were talking about this the other day. God is good. Krista was talking about that in her testimony. Jesse kind of hinted at that. God knows who we are. And he loves us. He's not trying to hurt us. Verse 19, he said, her, Give unto me thy, thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him into the loft, a loft where he abode and laid him on his own bed and cried unto the Lord and said, Lord, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Did I bring this? Is it because of me? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said unto Elijah, Huh, now by this I know thou art a man of God. You know what? There remains in every single child of God doubt. Enough doubt that God is continually trying to show us, you can trust me, you can trust me. How long do you suppose they had eaten that meal and, drunk and, and, and cooked it with the oil in that little cruise? Days, weeks, months, a year? It was more than one meal. She'd seen that. During that time, no doubt, Elijah had shared with her what God had done in his life Oh, yeah, wow, you, you did that. You spoke to the king like that? God sent food like that? Yeah. But you know what? When he does something for her, for her children, oh, now I know you're a man of God. I think that's crazy. But we all need some kind of testimony or some level of confirmation. We all need something in our life. And you know what? The only way you're going to get that confirmation of just how good God is, just how personal that God looks at you, just how much God is interested in your affairs is to trust Him with every single part of your life down to the life and death of your children. And when you can do that, ah, now I see it. Now I know. The success of the Christian life comes from not reading the Bible. That's a blessing. It's a plus. It's necessary. But it comes from living out that life of faith and trusting the God of the Bible to, to accomplish His will when we can't figure out what He's got in mind, when we can't see that. How do you think that poor woman felt when she found that child dead? All the things I've done for all this time, all the goodness God did, it's just erased, just like it's gone. You know what? They were living under signs and wonders, if that's what they saw. How much more do you and I need to live by faith? When God says, you're to walk by faith, not by sight. The challenge for you and I is to believe God. Respond to everything of God. You need to have faith in the work of God and the God of the work, the words that God gives, the wonder of God, just the amazement of how God's going to work and just the fact of his abundance. Faith should sum up our life. Some people are, well, I'm just, I'm busy. I do this, I do that. Lost people are busy. Don't let busyness distract you from developing a trust and a faith in God. Because one of the days, someone's life may depend on it. This, this is not one of those messages that I'm shouting and screaming. Yeah, it's just the reality of how our lives can be settled, established, built up in the Word, trusting the living God, 
It's a life of peace and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. You know, the effect of righteousness is peace. And peace is righteousness. The two go hand in hand. So many people's lives is turmoil and confusion. Maybe today you need to trust the Lord more. He's worthy of your trust. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you need to get saved today. Some of our young folks, I don't know whether you're saved or not. Maybe you don't even know if you're saved or not. But it'd be a good day to ask the Lord to save you and help you learn that life of living faith, walking with the Lord. Maybe there's forgiveness for something that you need. You know, I just don't see how I can forgive anybody for what they've done or how they can get along in life with that. Well, I don't know either, but I know God can show you and God can help you and God can lead you and God can comfort your heart, helping you know you did exactly the right thing. Whatever it is, it begins by responding to what God's provoked you to, to get the answers God has stored up for you. Let's stand. Can God really need, meet my needs? He sure can, and He sure will. Number 163 in our hymn books, only trust Him. You know, it's easy to trust God when everything is going well and the birds are bringing food and the water is running and healthy and everything's going good. When the water dries up, the meat don't show up at the table. That's the time to really let that trust settle in. Only trust it.